Blood and Roses, the third chapter in the Man of Iron system, uh, created by Richard Berg. Uh, the previous games are Man of Iron and Infidel, two games that I enjoyed very much. I enjoyed Infidel in particular, and Blood and Roses is a worthy sequel. It is a system that depicts a battles of the middle ages at the tactical level it is a simple system definitely could work as an introductory work game the rules are pretty straightforward uh, but it is a very rich system that captures a lot of interesting actions creates rich narratives and it is just pretty fun to play. Also, the battles are usually pretty manageable in terms of size and length. Uh, definitely you can play a battle in an evening, depending on the battle, maybe even more than one. And let me tell you a little bit about the system. I talked about the system in the past, but uh, the video in which I talked about the general system, I filmed quite some time ago. Maybe you need a refresher. So I'm going to cover not things in detail, but general concepts of the uh, Man of Iron system, in particular about the way in which the system is implemented in this new installment in Blood and Roses. I don't think, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but the system talks about the battles in the War of the Roses. The title kind of gives it away a little bit. England, 1455 to 1487. Uh, Middle Ages, according to some chronologists. Renaissance, according to others. But let's not fight about labels, let's fight battles instead. And to show you and to tell a little bit about some of the concepts, I will use a, a battle that I've set up here and I haven't played yet, I'm going to play it next. It is the Battle of Bloor Heath. This is the setup, I'll tell you a little bit more about the battle after I cover some of the main points of the system. The system uh, does not use standard uh, turns like I go you go in a sense it does but things are a little more fluid than they are in other games because uh, players use individual activations and players may be able to get several activations in a row so you may be able to activate several leaders and do several things before an opponent before the opponent goes okay it is in a way I go you go but as I said there's a lot of variety in the ways in which the I go you go is alternated Activations. When it is your turn to activate your army, you can choose one of several types of activations. You can choose to activate a battle, that is, you can choose to activate a group of soldiers that are uh, commanded by a leader. Leaders are special pieces on the board. Leaders have a range printed on them, in this case it is seven and units that are within command range uh, of their leader uh, get full activation, get to do all that they want within certain restrictions, but units that are out of command have further restrictions. So, leaders uh, activate units in their battle and then uh, units can act, and that is how a battle activation works. It is also possible to use an army activation. A larger number of units is activated using army activation, uh, but there are restrictions at this time about movement. That is, it is a type of activation that you use to move a large number of units fast, but the units cannot get close to enemy units. So it is mainly for movement. You can activate a standard, which is a special kind of sort of unit around the which um, units that have taken a serious hit can regroup and rally. So you can activate a standard to rally units or to move the standard. You can also pass. This is pretty interesting. I don't remember this in previous installments in the game, but I haven't played um, Infidel slash Men of Iron in, so, in some two years. Uh, timed engagement. Uh, if you pass, if you choose an, if you choose to spend an activation to pass, then you move the time marker on the general track on one of the player eights, and some engagements are timed. 
that means that one of the two sides needs to accomplish victory as much as possible, as fast as possible, and the other side has an advantage in delaying and stalling. Uh, this is good because it means that sides that historically attacked, uh, in this case, are forced to follow more or, le more or less historical guidelines. You can't, as the attacker, take more time to set up a perfect attack by careful maneuvering. Uh, you cannot do that better than it was done in history. If people launch a rush attack in history and you're playing that side, you're going to have to do things in a rush too. So the basic activations are battle activation from a leader, army activation, moving a lot of units, standard activation or a passing. However, here's the cool thing, you can also uh, try to have several activations in a row. In that case, you will need to, uh, to roll a die and see if you are able to, uh, to get multiple activations. Usually, you need to select a leader and you need to roll against the uh, activation rating of the leader. If you uh, roll under the rating of the leader, then you're able to activate that leader but the opponent can try to steal continuity from you using a seizure marker. Seizure markers are drawn randomly at the beginning of the game. Each player has a different pool of seizure markers. These are one-time benefits that you can then spend during the game. This is pretty cool. Um, it makes playing the game solitaire slightly uh, harder than it was in the past, but not much. I play a lot of multiplayer games in solitaire mode where there are sort of like secret advantages given by chits, and I never found it to be a problem to know what is in the opponent's uh, counter mix. I mean, mix of, of advantage markers. Also, you can just use to draw them uh, the first time that your side is trying to use one, so you have more surprise there. Seizure markers, uh, again, can give you uh, different advantages, and an advantage that several of these markers will give you is a seizure opportunity. Then you roll, and if the result is within the range indicated on the marker, you're able to steal continuity from the opponent. Also, you can simply negate the seizure of an opponent and there are other types of, of advantages that you can get. Battle cry, treachery, the battle book, I mean the rule book will tell you what these are. Now, uh, that is for the activations. What do your units do when they activate? Well, this is a war game, not a tea party, so what that means is uh, that units are going to move and or attack. Uh, moving, well, they just move up to their movement allowance, spending movement points depending on the terrain that they enter, and the movement allowance is printed in the bottom right corner of the unit. And of course, again, they can attack as the world should. Some units have missile fire, they have range attacks, for example, the longbow units certainly do that. Other units can um, try to do shock attacks, that is uh, combat in close quarters, uh, melee combat pretty much. Also, you may have mounted units that may attempt to charge. Now, uh, attacks are resolved in a pretty straightforward fashion, even though it may not look like that when you see the player raid. Um, a good thing this game comes with two player raids, that is, two copies of the same player raid. It seems obvious, it's a two player game, but so many games give you one player raid, which is just maddening if you are playing the game uh, with, with, a, with a real opponent and not in solitaire mode. Now, for attacking, well, let's start from fire combat. Uh, fire combat, again, it seems complicated when you see all these tables, but it is super simple. You roll a d10, you apply modifiers, and you see the result. It is that simple. The list of modifiers is a little scary at the beginning, including, including a modifier for range that you will figure out by cross-referencing the type of ranged unit that is firing with the distance that the unit is firing at that tells your modifier. But if you've played games of this type, you will become familiar with these things as you play the game. 
And so you just look at the situation in most cases, you know most of the modifiers that you need. Um, any, what's most important, you know when trying to get a shot at an opponent is simply not worth it. So in most cases, you know when you do not even need to start adding and subtracting modifiers. Once you have your modifiers, roll a die, look at the fire results table, depending on the type of unit that is firing, the status, normal or disordered of the unit. The units can be in order in an order state or they can be turned to the other side in which they are disordered and ranged units that are disordered also get a penalty for firing when they're disordered but the mark itself as a reminder for that um, that is for fire and then you have shock which is very similar in essence again the basic idea is simply um, Roll, apply modifiers, see what happens. The modifiers this time are listed in this other uh, table here. Possible DRMs for shock, that is melee or charge. And some units are not particularly good at defending. So actually they have a, a number of penalty uh, printed on them. And that means that that is actually a bonus to the attacker when they're attacked. Strength advantage based on the number of units that are attacking or being attacked. Weapon system matrix, again, something that seems um, complicated, but once you become familiar, you will know that sending mounting men at arms against, uh, um, against cavalry, against infantry, against other men, mounted men at arms has different effects. And you just think, uh, actually, this is the attacker that's sending them against different types of of units has a certain effect. You play narratively, you more or less know what's gonna happen if you send uh, infantry uh, infantry against the mounted men-at-arms. Uh, well, let's see, it's not that hard of an idea. Which again, you probably knew even before looking at the matrix. So, take that into account, take other modifiers that may or may not apply, Again, you'll become familiar with these in no time. Just thinking of them thematically. Oh, it looks like that sign is not a good position. That's probably a negative modifier. Let's look for that. And then you simply roll and you check the modified results on the table that applies. There's a table for shock combat results and a table for uh, charge combat results. Um, when you have charges in games about the Middle Ages, very often then you have some set of rules uh, that can get a little fiddly about well how charges work and then counter charges and sometimes counter, 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 counter charges. Um, it, gets, it, it becomes sort of like a, a guessing game who is going to counter charge more than the opponent. Uh, don't worry too much about those. Again, uh, they look scary in writing. They are not scary at all when you're playing the game. Uh, oh, somebody's knocking on the door and vigorously. I'll be back. Okay, I apologize for the interruption. Um, it was the ghost of Richard III knocking on the door. He wanted to get on video to say that he had been wrong by Shakespeare and by Tudor propaganda. I'm sorry, Richard, but I have a strict policy about ghosts on videos, so no, not going to happen. Now, back to uh, to the game. Uh, I explained the general concepts uh, around which each battle works. Victory conditions depend on the scenario instructions. You have quite a bit of scenarios. Uh, the battle book is pretty thick with notes, maps, explanations and things. Um, there is a good introductory scenario, the first Sand Bands, and here, as you can see from the map and the image depicting the setup, it is a pretty small scenario, so it is very good uh, for to practice, to practice the rules in case you are not familiar with the game or you haven't played games in the system for a while. Uh, good intro. But the game that I've set up and that I'm going to play in a couple of minutes is Blow Heath, this is the name of the battle, and here you have the setup with the Lancaster uh, attacking. They vastly outnumber the Yorkist defenders, and they have mounted units, uh, so that's pretty powerful stuff. 
However, they have the disadvantage of being forced to attack in a timely fashion because they are a timed side. Also, they clearly are in disadvantage in terms of terrain. There is this little uh, stream of water here that they have to cross. The Yorkists also have these caltrops. Some of these caltrops are actual caltrops, some are dummies. Uh, the opponent doesn't know that. I'm going to play the game solitaire, so to simulate that, I place them down blindly. I do not know where the caltrops are exactly. As the Yorkists play, you get to choose where you want to play the caltrops. Also, there is this uh, uh, trench here in case the opponents try to outflank uh, the, the defenders. There are carriages here that also protect against enemy charges. Definitely uh, with the fact that the, your, the, the attackers have to get the attack in as fast as possible and defenders have all of these advantages uh, due to terrain I think this is going to be a very cool situation strength in numbers versus strength in position now I'll play the game and then I'm going to report about it and probably in later sections of this video I'm going to show you uh, the setup of other battles just to give you a sense of, of some of the battles that come in the package this is the setup for the Battle of Barnet, which I'm going to play next. Uh, as you can see, as opposed to the battle I showed you in the previous segment, here we have a more balanced situation in terms of numbers. And also terrain is not as much of an issue because uh, the battle takes place on this plateau here that really doesn't have any distinguishing features uh, with the exception of this hedgerow here. The two uh, armies are deployed not perfectly aligned, that happened because one of the two sides deployed uh, the night before the battle, uh, miscalculating the position of the opponent, so we have this flank here, the opponent, which um, kind of like protrudes from this side, giving them an, an advantage in attempting an outflanking maneuver, but something similar can be said from this point of view here, from this other side here. Uh, so, once I play the battle, I haven't played it yet, uh, the battle may have a little bit of a revolving door feel to it, with one side pushing this direction, the other side here, and the people in the middle, I don't know, doing as much mess as they can. The battle historically was um, characterized by a dense fog that covered the battlefield. Uh, this caused uh, interesting things to happen. For example, one side firing upon people of their own side by mistake. Reminds me of something that happened in Germantown. Uh, different war, of course. Uh, uh, to simulate the fog, uh, the standard rule here is that no charges or counter charges are allowed it, because you don't want to charge when you don't see where the heck you're going and also there is going to be a steep penalty for uh, artillery and longbow firing. This actually, when I see all of these things together, it makes me think that uh, even though the size is larger than what you have in other battles, this could still be a quote-unquote introductory battle to the system. Maybe after you play uh, the central bands or the first central bands, this could be a good battle to go next, that is just to learn how to maneuver large numbers of units, pretty larger number of units, without having to worry too much about terrain, charge rules, counter charge rules, and even missile units, not so much. This could be a perfect uh, scenario to just train yourself to uh, play with the activations and with maneuvering units basic rules and with shock combat. I'm pretty curious to see how the battle goes and again I, this is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to play the scenario. This is the setup for a battle that I'm going to play next. It looks like it is gonna be pretty straightforward. The only thing that is not very straightforward to me is the name. I really have no idea how to pronounce that so I will skip that part. Uh, this setup for this battle sees the two armies lined up on the two sides of this terrain feature here, which is a mix of adros and brushes, which of course will make things interesting, especially for the side that they will try to cross it, as that side is firing with longbows and artillery and handguns. Not many special rules here, really it seems to me that the fun of the thing will be 
from the terrain and from what appears to be a pretty evenly matched um, contest, but there are some special rules. There is an ambush unit that will uh, support the Yorkist side and that will enter from this area here, from this edge here. Uh, ambush rules say that units that are ambushing the opponent will enter with a free activation, will get double movement during their, their first activation as they are launching their ambush, and also, well, ambushes have a very disheartening psychological effect on the enemies, so after the ambushing unit moves, all of the uh, enemy units that are adjacent to it and not disordered become disordered and the disordered units that are adjacent to it uh, at the end of its movement uh, are simply retired. So it can be a pretty powerful option. Also we know that historically Somerset, who is here, launched a flank attack and to simulate the momentum of that flank attack, uh, Somerset can activate several times in a row. You can choose that multiple activation thing once in a game, then when you start activating other leaders you can go back to it. But you can try to reactivate him several times, which is not allowed usually. Usually you can activate a leader and then you have to move to another leader and then you keep changing and switching. You cannot activate the same leader twice in a row. You can with Somerset. I like Blood and Roses very much. This is a fine, fine game. Uh, I like the components, I like the graphics. Uh, Everything looks nice, everything is functional. Maybe if if I were to nitpick a little bit, I would say that some of the red counters uh, that belong to different battles and are differentiated by color stripes, all those color stripes sometimes could have been of colors that stand out from one another a little bit better. There are some of those stripes that are dark yellow or darker yellow and lighter yellow and they belong to different battles. It's a very small thing, really. I'm mentioning just to show you that I spent some time with those counters and I got to, to, well, to, to, to wish that uh, I could tell them apart much better. But this is such a small thing because what matters here is that we have a game that has that is based on a very solid system and this is a great implementation of that system. Man of Iron, the first game in the system, uh, I liked the system there, I didn't like the implementation all that much because the battles tended to be quite uh, stationary and somewhat a little scripted, that was the feel that I got. I liked Infidel very much, which was the opposite, it was all about mobility, it was all about uh, light cavalry coming in, uh, riding around and delivering huge volleys of arrows. Here we say that we have a uh, a good balance uh, when it comes to uh, static uh, aspects of the battle and mobility maneuvering. Uh, sometimes the battle will devolve in a frontal clash and, one, and when the two armies get in contact then they get stuck there. Uh, but in most cases uh, there are uh, opportunities for maneuvering and moving around your armies uh, before you get to that contact. Uh, to do enough maneuvering really to to give a certain a certain flow to the action and to make uh, maneuvering interesting to open possibilities there. The terrain tends to be open terrain, so you do not have to worry too much about it. But as you've seen, at least in some of the maps that I showed you, with some pretty cool features here and there. Not say like. 20 different types of terrain that you have to get obsessed about all the modifiers and all the effects that each type of terrain has more like plain terrain with one terrain feature that you you get to learn what that does and you interact with that i really like the flow and the pace of the game again this uh, fact that you can maneuver you can move units around you can set up an attack you can trick your opponent and then when the confrontation starts, uh, blows are heavy. These battles are extremely brutal. Um, and I believe that in this, the game really captures the, the feel of, of the historical events. Uh, the length of the battles is just right. It tends to be uh, between two and three hours for the main battles, at least that's for me. Um, and, that's, and that's just great because uh, 
the battle doesn't take forever yet uh, it has a certain level of complexity there's enough meat there for the battle to reach a level of complexity to uh, develop in several quote-unquote acts in which one part of the battlefield uh, is more active and another one is more dormant the, the momentum of the action may switch uh, the armies may try to flank each other there is enough narrative there uh, and yet the narrative is very tight because again within two or three hours uh, the battle will will be over and the battle will have created a very intense experience more than infidel and even more than men of iron really there's a certain intensity a certain quality feel of intensity in the way uh, the battles escalate from the initial uh, movement to a powerful clash and then to just sense as bloodshed on the battlefield Blood and Roses, I definitely enjoyed this game very much. I enjoy the way the system is implemented here, I enjoy what was done with the basic system. These scenarios are fun to play, they don't feel too fiddly. Sometimes you have in other games scenarios that have so many special rules that each scenario is almost like you have to relearn the game. Not here, some scenarios have more complexity than others, but overall uh, the scenarios are very manageable. The battles are manageable and very playable. The game, bottom line, is truly fun. I love it and I highly recommend it. Blood and Roses by GMT.